Hello and welcome to the Six Figure Developer Podcast, a podcast where we talk about new and exciting technologies, professional development, clean code, career advancement, and more. I'm John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I'm John Ash. With us today is Christina Willer. Christina is currently a Principal Solution Architect at Canvas Consulting with over 15 years of experience in the industry. Christina has knowledge in SharePoint development, administration, branding, and business intelligence. Welcome, Christina. Hey, how's it going? Uh, so, Christina, uh, before we kind of jump into the meat of things, uh, would you kind of give our audience a little introduction to yourself? You know, perhaps tell them how you got started in the industry? <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, let's see, I was born in the tech field. <laughs> 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 no, now I'm really going to show my age. Um, when I was 11, I was copying GW base or G or basic code. Can't remember which one it was out of a book using a TI-99, Texas Instruments 99, plugged into a tape deck, copying code so my brother and I could play games. Yes. Then, nice. And then after that, I learned, my dad learned how to, uh, my grandfather was real big into Tandy computers and Radio Shack. So he would buy my dad Tandys and my dad would learn how to take them apart and put them back together. So that's when he learned how to build computers. And then he taught me how to build a computer when I was 13. Nice. So that was what I've done. And then I, you know, got into, taught myself how to program, but I couldn't at the time, you know, I was more like a hack developer where I can make things work, but I couldn't tell you how I did it. <laughs> right. If I had to do an interview at the back then, I could well, film unless if I could sit down and code, I was good. But if you're going to ask me questions back then, forget it, you know. And then later in life, I went back to school and actually learned all the technical terms. Um, so yeah, but uh, I've been in I have been in the IT field for a long time. So I was an old VB C sharp developer. I've been a SQL DBA. Got into business intelligence, uh, business objects, all that stuff. Then one day I got thrown into SharePoint. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I think at the time it was actually called Tahoe, but yeah. And I remember my first production project was SharePoint 2001 or something and was involved in SharePoint for a very long time. Um, and then uh, Office, I was a BPOS user personally. Then I got involved in Office 365. I swore off Office 365 for about a year uh, when I had to deal with search. And I became a, uh, I got really heavily involved in search because I got thrown on a project and normally I would have a search expert, but then that forced me to really learn search. And that's when I discovered um, it, Office 365 was not ready at that time for these big enterprise search, you know, <laughs> customers. Uh, full disclosure. So then uh, what actually brought me back to the cloud was Power BI. Hmm. So then Power BI brought me back to the cloud. And ever since then, you know, before I'm like, I don't want any cloud projects and now it's like ooh, on-prem no i just want cloud just you know mm. so uh i I've, I've been through the whole evolvement and as you know it continues to grow really do come on man uh, <laughs> <laughs> i've been through all the different you know all the different ups and downs of the cloud and i've really uh, it's amazing to see how far office 365 and and, and the power platform and, and business intelligence all that stuff has come along from when i first started with all of it so uh, what do you work on like these days? What What's uh, pretty typical for you? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I was an independent consultant for a decade. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, just now I, I was working on some migration projects um, and we have an awesome dev team at Canvas. And so I've been helping them. We've been doing some 
we do a lot of uh, power apps development mm -hmm. and, and so on. But uh, I just recently started, um, this is my second week. Last week was onboarding. I, I'm on a full-time project at Microsoft. Um, and what I'm working on is, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. I'm, can you guys give me one second? Sure. <laughs> sure. Hey, wait, what's up with you, dude? He wants to be part of the show. So um, can you guys hear him in the background? Just or is he fake? Ever so slightly. slightly. Yeah, okay, yeah. then as long as he's slightly, you don't hear him the way he's piercing in my ear, then we're good. Okay, so I just, um, I'm, I'm still onboarding, so I'm still wrapping my head around things, but I'm working with, uh, so RPA, um, RPA processes, and I'm basically now helping out, I'm the deployment um, success manager for Power mm -hmm. Automate and Customer Insights. So that's what I'll be working on for a while. I'm really excited. Um, so I'm gonna be able to see and help with these engagements with the partners and with Microsoft. So I'll be working with the Power Cat teams and the engineering team and to help uh, facilitate to make sure that we have smooth deployments. Awesome. So that's my latest. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so for, for those of us who might not be as familiar, what? You know, I'm I'm hearing a lot these days about power platform, power automate, power this, power that. What what is all of the the power uh, language that is happening these days? So, as you, uh, so the power if power so the power platform consists of Power BI, Power Automate, which I still call it Flow, um, Power Apps, and Power Virtual Agents. Hmm. But truth be told, I haven't done. I haven't done a lot with Power Virtual Agents yet. I'm moving up, if you can tell, with my standing desk. Um, so, uh, but it's the whole, it's, 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 to me, so with Power Apps, I love Power Apps. Now I will, I'll be full disclosure on this too. I started with the beginning of the, of the, the product and I was banging my head against the wall. But I think a lot of us even did that with SharePoint, right? The very beginning, banging your head against the wall. So seeing that change and that transition as well has been awesome to see how much it's improved. But the whole purpose is um, one for power apps, to, for citizen developers to have people to be able to create forms and processes without having to write code, without having to touch Visual Studio, right? And then Power Automate, which at first I was hesitant about the name change. And then. Um, <laughs> So uh, at first I thought, why are you guys changing the name? But now I get it. And of course, I, I'm not wearing the legacy t-shirt and the hat today, but I have the power ups with no space. Cause you know, it started with no space, but then they added the space, which I get power BI, power space BI, power space automate, right? But um, you know, coming from the old SharePoint days, right? If you wanted to integrate with other systems, it was very complex. Um, so it was really hard. So what I love is that fact that you have the power platform and you can engage with all these connectors and say, okay, I can tie in all these different systems and build these different processes based on that. And that's what I love. And I think it's, you know, a lot easier to be able to build solutions now through the power platform. So when, when are they going to add Azure to the front of that? Well, it'll just be power Azure. <laughs> power Azure, right? <laughs> so, um, and, and but this brings up another thing because one of the things, and I've seen this transition as well, before you had all these different services and you're going to Teams, you're going to SharePoint, you're going to Power BI and all that stuff. And now be, since our world has turned into the Twilight Zone, what last year, 2020, that's the only way I can describe it. Um, once again, I'm dating myself, um, but before you had companies that were implementing Teams or learning about Teams. Well, now I think a lot more people know Teams because even if I mm -hmm. go out to the store and I'm wearing Microsoft Teams, I get, oh, I use Teams. Oh, we use Teams at our work. And so what you're seeing now is so many, you know, since everybody, so many more people now are working from home. Um, and the product group has, has done an amazing job in being able to integrate all of these different services within Teams. So this is what, what I've been helping people understand and becoming an advocate for is, Let's try to, people are living in Teams. Let's try to surface all this information in Teams. So bring the Power Platform into Teams. And a lot of people aren't aware that you can do that. So I may have a Power App that I can have as an icon within Teams that they click on, or it could be a Teams tab that they go click on, fill out the form, 
and um, you can have uh, flows feed directly into a channel now. So that way the person approving it doesn't have to go to the actual flow service. They can just go within Teams, they get the notification, they go and approve that uh, flow directly within Teams. So what I like, I'm passionate about all of this and I think, you know, I was, I was passionate about SharePoint a long time ago and I still think SharePoint's great. It has its, you know, great, you know, most people don't realize that Teams behind Teams is SharePoint. Um, one of the things I get is, well, we have Teams, can we turn off SharePoint now? So, but what I love is taking all of this and combining it together and helping improve business processes and helping people to improve their everyday work life through all the Power Platform, Teams, SharePoint, and so on. And so that's where my passion is now. But I think it's a really good opportunity because you know, SharePoint's been around for 20 years. Now you look at Teams, there's so much evolving within Teams. You've got Power Platform, so much involving within that now. So I think that there's a great opportunity, even for developers, like Teams development is a great opportunity and the Power Platform is a great opportunity because it's still, yes, it's been around, but it hasn't been around as long as SharePoint, right? So there's so much that you can do and just build. And, and, and what the thing I'm seeing is Companies are implementing teams. They're overwhelmed. They're not aware of what you can do. So that's what I'm trying to, to show is say, look, here's this use case. Let me show you what you can do. And it blows them away because they had no idea that I can have this, you know, uh, <clears throat> request a team process. And someone can go and request a team directly within Teams using a Power App. And that they go to request a team. It goes through an approval process, gets approved. And then this is where Azure comes in because there is a logic app behind the scenes, <laughs> but have building processes and helping educate people on learning that there's so much more that you can do with teams and integrating the power platform and all these other things to help your business. Yeah, that's, that's where I am because I use teams as uh, a, a, a chat uh, client. I, I use it for meetings. I use it for video calls. Um, from time to time, we'll maybe uh, wire up Azure DevOps to uh, publish the results of a build pipeline, yep. for example. Um, you know, I've seen some some uh, forms and, and questions and polls and things like that. Uh, so I'm not familiar. Do there are, are uh, power apps that I can I can integrate? There, there's all kinds of things that we can. Uh, introduce into teams, but I don't know what, what is possible, but I, I've also never really been the idea person. I usually implement others ideas. So, so what are the things that are possible and take your time? So one of the things, um, this actually, I double checked the link to make sure it works, but there, Microsoft has released these app templates and these app templates, you can go to AKA dot ms teams app templates and what this gives you and you can also search now you can bing it you can google it but bing it you know what bing stands for because it's not google <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> but uh they have these app templates which there's everything from a messaging extension to bots to um, i think there's about nine power platform solutions right now and I brought up request a team and request a team is actually one of them. But what Microsoft's doing is looking for different business scenarios, which would be helpful for organizations and building these templates that you can implement. So you don't have to start from scratch. And so this is what I think is really nice to get into. Um, and even just deploying the request a team one, there's a great one to kind of say, oh, wow, it to me, even if you may not, you might just want to deploy some of these app templates to see how they work. And I recommend it, even if you just want to learn how, you know, the different things that are available is because deploying those actually helps you see what you can do. So you're not having to write an app from scratch. You're not having to write a bot from scratch. You're deploying these templates as is, but then you also have full access to everything. You download everything from GitHub. There's full deployment instructions. So you can deploy it as is, or you can say, you know what? I love the solution. It's great. I deployed it, but now I want to modify it to kind of fit my business needs, add some more functionality to it. So you're not starting from scratch and then you can go in and modify it to fit your needs from everything. Like I said, bot messaging extension, power apps, and so on. 
So to me, I think that's what I've kind of been advocating. I think it's, it's, and I'm seeing more people go to that. They're like, oh, Christina, I had no idea I can do this. Or I really wanted this process. I didn't know Microsoft had this that I could download and mm. implement for free. Yeah, and, and from that link, I see there's an adoption bot, there's associate, associate insights, uh, attendance, uh, grow your skills, HR support, icebreakers. I mean, all kinds of stuff listed here. There is, um, and the, one of the demos I've done, it's actually one of some of my favorite ones are messaging extensions, but I think that's too because I'm, you know, me being a developer. But uh, the it's called Stickers, and it's a stickers app, but it's a messaging extension. And this is one of the first few ones that Microsoft created. And I actually like this one, and the reason being, I see a good use case behind it. Now I have demos I built on that one, but when you deploy Teams, you have everything enabled including the fun stuff. If you go to the settings in a team now, you have the fun stuff little section there, which gives all the gifts and memes. Hey, all the gifts and memes and so on. But you may want to lock that down and say, you know what? I want to disable this. I want to allow my users to be able to post images and so on, but I want to control that. So stop it. Sorry, guys. My dogs are getting a little out of control. <laughs> Come on, go out outside, go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, so let me re re restart. So messaging extensions, you may not want to have everything enabled mm -hmm. or you have the teams that say, okay, you know what? We want to lock this down some and then decide what we want to enable. But then, and this is where I like the stickers app because we can say, you know what? Here's our corporate approved images. We're going to allow people to post. And you can control that and say, okay, we can turn off the func other functionality. So the fun stuff, right? And have our own fun stuff. And uh, so that to me is a good use case. And when I demo that, that's where I see people going, oh yeah, this is, I really like this idea. Cause they either turn it all off or, and then not realize that they can use this. Hmm. Or you might, you know, and not saying you have to do that for everything, but you might have specific teams, even teams with external guest access where you want to lock it down more. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they've, Microsoft, like I said, has done a very good job on thinking through some different use cases and they're also open to hearing feedback. They want people to come back and say, you know what, here's a use case that I would love to see an app template for. So, and you're gonna see it grow because there was only about three or four and now there's a lot more. <laughs> I'm looking at it right now, there's a whole lot more. So, um, so my company is the reason why I can't search for poop and Giphy <laughs> on Teams. Pretty much. I can search, I, I, I guess they didn't put the keywords in good enough because I can search for poo but I can't search for poop. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> we've got, we've got, you know, like dev group chats that are normally uh, a bit more loosey goosey than, than your typical business team stuff. So, uh, oh. you know, the giffies, they do fly, but. Yeah. And I, I just, <laughs> I just uh, clicked on one of the GitHub repos of, of one of the random um, templates that was listed in the site there. And it, it brought me to a uh, Office Dev Microsoft Teams apps training, uh, training app template. And it looks like the, the language of choice in this one is JavaScript. Is that, are all of the templates JavaScript at that point? Can we write our own? What, where would we get started with something Ooh, like Which this? one did you click on? Uh, let me see. You got me wondering now. Uh, it was training, get it on GitHub. Oh, oh. Oh, look at that. That's a new one. That is a new one. And that is a messaging extension. Oh, let's see here. Um, yeah, that's a team's messaging extension. So this is so the way that messaging extensions are built, and this is where I think it's good uh, to go and kind of dive into um, just kind of the team's dev framework, because then you'll help understand, OK, this is what the, this is the technology behind messaging extensions. This is the technology behind bots. Right. And then Power Platform and so on. But, um, you know, everything's client side scripting now. Right. Pretty much because you're not doing server. You know, I was a hardcore server side developer. So getting <laughs> off of farm solutions was a big struggle for me at first because I was used to server side code in SharePoint. I was used to, uh, I, I was used to just being able to whip stuff up quickly, right? And not having to deal, let's just say it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. And, uh, um, 
and uh, I loved building um, event receivers. I loved writing event receivers. And so the thing, though, is you have these client tools now. You have Teams. Yes, you have a desktop app, but everything is still cloud-based. Everything is still, you know, you're not doing server-side code anymore. So messaging extensions are built. All this stuff, a lot of it is built off JavaScript. Hmm. So there might be a little security concerns there, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I noticed uh, in the package dot json for that one uh, there is a reference to jquery version 3.5.1 so uh, a relatively newer instance of jquery but uh, that's this the first is, you know what to be honest this is the first one i've seen um because i don't the other ones i use i or the it depends on what the actual app template is doing but this i have to look into this one this is a different one this is a new one that i haven't seen so some of the other ones that you deployed not everything's this is the first one to hear of that I I heard that actually has jQuery running in it. What what's uh, do you have a favorite on this list, or do you have a go to that uh, clients are often requesting or, or utilizing? Request a team. That's okay. the big one because, and that's the power that's a power um, platform solution. Biggest complaints I have with people right now in organizations in teams is the concern of we don't want to just allow everyone to be able to create a team, but we also don't want to lock it down so hard that nobody can create a team. So this is governance has been a very important thing right now. And the biggest questions I've been asked is how can we, can, is there a process we can build um, for allowing people to request to have a team created? And of course, yes, you can go and create your own solution, but Microsoft has a very good app template right there that you can deploy that leverages a power app, a flow and Azure extensions. And so what happens is you would deploy it and there's a SharePoint, actually a SharePoint too. You have a SharePoint list that's gonna um, basically be your data store for that mm -hmm. Power App. And so the process, and it's all built. Like I deployed this, I didn't change anything and it works beautifully. And so what it is, is that someone can go in and request a team. And so they'll request a team, they'll put in a name and then they'll check the availability. That when they check the availability, a flow is gonna kick off to determine and see if that's actually available or not. And then if it is, it'll go through a process that it's going to go through and say, okay, yep, it's available. They go through the process, decide if they want to do blank or choose from a template. And then they submit that request. And then I have another Teams uh, team with the channel just for the approvers and the admins. And now they can go in and see the, that re all the requests that come in and decide to approve or reject it. Then if they approve the team to be created, then there's a logic app that runs uh, in Azure to actually build the team based upon that request that came in. And so that by default, and when you deploy that, there's full blown instructions on that. And that logic app actually is on a scheduled time. So right now by default, it's scheduled to check every hour, but you can change that. And then once that process runs or the logic app runs, it takes about five and a half minutes to create the team, yeah. but I've tested it. It works beautiful. So to me, that's one thing I've been recommending um, organizations use, and then so far everybody's loving it because it's helping them lock down, um, not you know, so that they can go through an approval process for a team to be created. What are the moving pieces involved with getting all of that orchestration to, to work in concert? Is, is it, uh, do you get access to all of those bits or is it just a matter of wiring up the the processes that Microsoft has already released for consumption. So no, you get the, all the bits. So what happens is when you go, like for this example, I'm on the um, the page for the Teams app templates. I'm looking at the request to Team One, and then you'll have a link for each one of these that will uh, have a link. Get it on GitHub. And so when you click to get it on GitHub, what it's going to give you there is all where you can download all the files for the deployment. And in this case, um, this is a power app. So uh, we we'll, also have documentation and then there's a link for a deployment guide. And on the deployment guide is where you're gonna have all the steps to do the deployment. And every deployment is gonna be different depending upon what you're deploying, right? This one of course is a power app and a SharePoint list and so on. And so it walks you through all the steps to get it deployed in your own tenant. Mm. So you have mm -hmm. everything. I have the power app, I have the flow, I have the, the Azure functions, I have everything. So it's in my own tenant, so I have the bits, that's it. Right. And so that's what they're providing for you for like a messaging extension. You're deploying that. I have that running in my own Azure tenant. So it's basically saying, here's the solution for you. Here's the deployment guide. Have at it. 
and it looks like there's a, another one that uh, that we had discussed early on. I think um, uh, another one that should we uh, find her. Let me start over. Um, so it looks like there's an another one called building access. So should we find ourselves going back on, into offices and, and yep. such? Is that what this uh, this app is is would be used for? Yes. And actually, this is a very, very good app. And I, I think I've built a demo on this one as well or deployed it and tested it. Um, now, this doesn't really apply for me because I'm work from home and um, always have been work from home before everybody else did. Uh, but I would go on site right at Microsoft or my employer and so on. Um, but this is exactly what this app is intended for. So this app is for building access. So a couple of things what you can do is set up uh, your different floors your different, you know, you you can form it based upon your needs right, of saying, okay, here's how many floors we have, here's you set up your office, whatever you, however your structure is, and then how many max people you are gonna allow on that floor, right? So, right, because of COVID now, you're not allowing all the max capacity, right, that you normally would. So then you can control that and say, okay, we've got this um, building access app here where you can go in and say, I, I, I need to go in the building at this time and I wanna be able to go so then you can control how many people and have, you know, validate their access and, and approve it and so on. So that's a very, very good template. And that's another new one, fairly new. Cool. So, so let's say you found one of these templates that really sort of fit a need and you pulled it down and maybe mod made some modifications to it and now you've got it out to your, to your whole team and whatnot. What's the sort of, what's the story for now I need to make a fix a bug that I released because we're custom developers, you know, we, we, we do those as much as release features and, um, you know, and we need to push out that bug. So what's the like, like automated deployment story or am I having to like contact everyone on the team to like, how, how do I get that new version out? So it depends on what app you're deploying. Okay. It really depends. If you're doing a mess, if you're doing anything on the team's dev side, like a bot or messaging extension and stuff, right? You're just dealing with that from the tenant level. But if you're doing a power app, depends on what, how you're doing it, right? Let's say you take this power app and then you say distribute it out. So you might have one in five, just an example, five different tenants, or you have five different mm. versions of the power app, right? Yeah, it's a little bit of a different process, but though what I might do is you might want to create that as a solution. So it honestly, it's kind of a case by case in determining based upon what solution you're deploying. Okay. Now, you yeah. could also run into issues with deploying some of these app templates. And if you do, because as you know, APIs change, Azure, oh, lots mm -hmm. of stuff change, oh, right? Yeah. So if you do run into an issue, um, raise, like if like, let's say you're deploying the building access, you run into a problem, because they're all in GitHub repos, just raise the issue for mm -hmm. that specific template in GitHub. And the product group is monitoring that so they can resolve the issues. But let's say you modify it, right? You have an issue and you want to deploy it out. That's a different story. Is there, is there, uh, so like, let's say I, like on, for one of those, like really client side, client heavy, is there a, is there a smooth process for that? Or is that like, how difficult, how difficult is that? Uh, well, power platform. <laughs> <laughs> However, you're dealing with it on, uh, you could run into some issues. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You could. And it's just, and that's the thing. I mean, any type of deployment, even if you developed your own custom app, you're still going to run into the same yeah. deployment issues yep. because it's a limitation of the actual technology, right? Power platform, you have issues. I have issues trying to go from one tenant to another, but that's kind of some of the limitation within the platform itself, right? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and I will tell you, the product group's also working on helping improve all of that processes and so on. But any headache that you've already, like, for example, Power Platform and Power Apps, any headache you've already been dealing with on creating your own apps, chances are you're going to deal with it with these two because it's still part of the platform. Got it. But okay. like I said, that's where you address it and so on. But let's say if you actually just have an issue with the app itself that has mm -hmm. nothing to do, then that's where you can raise the issue on GitHub. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I have a love-hate relationship with technology. Just <laughs> no, we understand. <laughs> Always have. <laughs> so if, if, a, if a company or, or an individual uh, at a company had never messed with any of these, any of these power apps and they wanted to kind of like a, a soft introduction, is there 
um, a good one that has a simple flow to, to add it in and kind of start to play with? Or um, are they all the same? Actually, what I would recommend if somebody's if a company's new to Power Platform and new to Power Apps and so on, I would recommend them just getting familiar with Power Apps in general because you can go and create a new Power App from a template, and that's what I recommend. I said, you know what, get comfortable with the templates that are there when you go create a new Power App. Mm -hmm. That's where I would recommend people start with before they even try to touch any of these app templates, so that they can just get comfortable with the platform. And same with with Flow, right? Power Automate just kind of get comfortable with it there. And Microsoft has also done a really good job um, with their guided learning. You know, if you go to to the Power Apps, you've got documentation and guided learning. You go to Power Automate, you have the same thing. And I'm uh, doing a lot of videos and so on. So that's what I recommend. <laughs> so a along those lines, um, we obviously come from the pretty like custom development uh, background and the what where where's the sort of um line there can be a lot of sometimes animosity i think between the low code no code solutions and the like we can do everything with our bits and ones and zeros right um and where where's the where's the where's the good space for um you know doing doing something with power apps versus saying okay and where do you go too much uh when you you know, what, what's the problem space that, that, that becomes too much? Uh, and then you say, okay, no, we have to do something custom development. Well, and I never thought I would say this because I was a custom developer for a long time. But I think, I think that um, uh, before I would, I would, it depends on what your business scenario is. Get out, get out, go, get out. Sorry, guys work from home with dogs. Um, <laughs> it depends. I've always, I've always been this type of person, especially when I was having to approach project with SharePoint is saying, okay, what can we do out of the box and what do we have to customize and map to that? Where I had some other people, you know, other developers that were all about writing custom code, no matter what. Yeah. Well, I've seen it where back in my old days where people would write a custom web part for a web part that already existed. They just right. weren't aware of it. Right. right. Yep. So from the coding standpoint, I think it depends on the need. Mm. Now, I wouldn't try to over-engineer a power app. I would say, okay, what, what is the solution that needs to be created? What are our options? It could be a scenario where you have some part of a solution where you have a power app as part of that solution, but it's okay. not the overall. Okay. So then your power app could actually have part of the process and maybe it kicks off a flow and then maybe a flow or the power app then goes and kicks off a logic app or an Azure function or something like that, right? So, or even calls a web service, a little custom web service you have. And it's just putting all these pieces together and and to build that overall solution. And that's, I think that's why I like being a solution architect because I just love <laughs> fitting all the pieces of the puzzle. But then what I've seen is where and I get why people do this because they're working within either their skill sets or what they have within their team. And I've seen it and I've learned the hard way too, where over engineered a power app, right? Mm -hmm. Do it once and you'll never do it again. <laughs> and and it's the thing is saying, okay, and that's what I've seen people do where they're trying to do too much. And it's like, no, 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 let's take a step back. Look at what you're trying to build and see what other pieces we can put together in this to make it the overall solution work. So that's where I see it. And if you're going to start doing extremely complex stuff in Power Apps, might be better off as a custom web app. Mm. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. When when you have a, when you have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But I, I mean, I will tell you, I do like being able to write a Power App to do certain things. It's like, yeah, I can write a web application to do this, but why? If I can just mm. have this piece of it in a Power App, and then maybe have another side of it be the actual web application yeah so how I, I know i guess that's sort of what we're trying to do right now but like uh I, I guess how can developers get more exposure to those sort of tools because obviously the more tools we can have in our tool belt the more times we can actually bring the right tool to the job right and um sort of like you're saying solution architect the right solution in that in that moment so do you have any ideas on like how where where how developers can sort of get that get the get more of those tooling that tooling guided Exposure. learning training really yeah. training 
crowdfunding is going to be your best bet. Just getting hands on. And, and it's more of, here's what I challenge developers to do. Is saying, okay, maybe you already have an existing solution. And maybe you're not going to re-architect it. But you could use that as an example. Saying, okay, we have this web application here. But I wonder if I can do this a little differently. And then maybe take that as an example and say, okay, I'm going to try to build this part of the functionality in a Power App. Mm -hmm. I'm going to build that in a Power App and, and, and flow and see if I can make that work. And I've seen that happen to where developers will go with that approach and go, wow, this is actually pretty cool. Now you're going to have headaches, I'm not going to lie. You are going to have headaches as a developer. You will, right? Because, um, I mean, it's expressions. You're using expressions. You are putting <laughs> right, logic right. in there. If you've worked with, you know, uh, there will be some headaches. But there's also, to me, I, I, I actually enjoy it. And... Um, I do now and the things that you can do. So that's my challenge. Take a solution you already have and, and even just as a pet project. So you know what? I want to learn this. You're either going to hate it or going to love it. Or you might go kicking and screaming in the beginning, but then you might embrace it afterwards. because You might start to build something and realize, I actually do see a good use case for this, and here's mm. why. Yeah, it seems like we're, we've been decomposing what we've been working on for the past 15 or 20 years. We started with a, a software development lifecycle that consisted of 20 weeks for a project uh, in, in a waterfall methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we started with the monolith, then we started breaking apart microservices, then we've, we've started looking into things like Azure Functions for one-off executions and things like that. So maybe this is just further decomposing that monolithic application into little features here and there that can be quickly spun up and delivered in new and interesting ways. You know, and I, I was, I grew up in the waterfall approach, right? Because I'd be in the old school dev that I was. And then once I had, what, well, agile, what's this? What, what do you mean agile, right? That was a shift for me. But I was forced to go an agile method once I started getting into SharePoint development, because that's what you had to do. Or you never were going to get a project done. You can't, you cannot do waterfall with, with SharePoint dev. And I, I see the same thing with Teams dev and things like that, with the cloud, with the ever evolving cloud. It's just yeah. a mm -hmm. whole different mindset and approach now. Um, but that's how I look at it. And I still, I love custom coding. Um, I remember teaching ooh, teaching myself Angular, which was Angular 2. Oh, Sorry. That was, <laughs> you know, I remember my friend AC told, I, I, I reached out and said, look, I took over this project. I do not know Angular. What are my options? I'm like, it's written in AngularJS, but I see that there's Angular 2. Do I learn that? Rewrite it? Do I learn this? What do I do? He, and he, we, he confirmed what I felt, but then he said, Christina, it's going to take you about a week to wrap your head around it. Yep, it took about a week. A week of long days, long nights, wrapping my head. I can't tell you how many times I rewrote. Oh, look. Oh, I can do it this way. Oh, I can do that. But, uh, but yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> So uh, I haven't touched Angular since that project. <laughs> Probably smart. Yeah. So, but um, I'm, I actually really am enjoying the Teams dev stuff. And, and as developers, I recommend diving into the bots. Look, start diving into the messaging extensions because mm -hmm. they're actually pretty fun. They really are fun, I think. Yeah. So, but yeah. I don't know. I've, I've, I've shifted. Uh, I've shifted, and friends told me. A friend of mine told me too that like, oh, I even said it. I said, "Hell froze over, pigs fly now," because now I'm all cloud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, for our listeners who really, you know, got excited about this and and are kind of interested in, uh, I know we've mentioned the um, Teams app templates space, but are there any other resources that you would, you know, kind of call out to? People that are trying to trying to get started and trying to sort of learn about that um, the power power platform. Like I said, going on to the you know I wouldn't say this a long time ago because you know you didn't have all that documentation. But even when you just if you go to the Teams app templates, the aka.ms/slash Teams app templates, when it takes you to the page on the left hand side, you're going to have all these references here, and this is all the stuff for the Teams dev. Uh, but you can go in, it's like the Office Dev Center. That's where I recommend people go to, and that's where this documentation is. But if you start there and you start drilling your way in, you're going to see all this stuff. So depends on what you want to learn or, or, or get involved in, right? 
Uh, but the do like I said, Microsoft's done a phenomenal job on the documentation and they're keeping it up to date. So mm -hmm. I'm finding people are, are doing really well learning that way. Excellent. Oh. I, I don't know about you, but that, I was always a self-taught developer, like mm -hmm. I said. And I, I like being hands-on and seeing things. So the other thing you, uh, you can do too, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but you can sign up for the Office, or now it's Microsoft, the Microsoft 365 Developer Program. Hmm. And I have many of them. You can, you tie it to uh, an email account. So you might, I have a couple of different developer tenants based upon different uh, scenarios or customers or things like that. But it's basically becomes a sandbox environment for you. Uh, you get 25 E5 licenses on that. It's renewable every 90 days. So it checks the, t uh, t t uh, can never say this word, telemetry, t t t t t I can't say that word. Telemetry. Thank you. <laughs> say that again. Telemetry. Why am I struggling with that word? Yes, that word. Um, so as long as you're actively using it, then it will auto renew. Hmm. But if you don't stop using it, then it will actually expire. But that's what I use um, to test, to basically play around so I'm not affecting any production environments. Um, and the other thing you can do too is there's a Power Apps community plan that you can tack onto that. And you just search for that. I'll try to get the links for that. But I can, you can tack that onto it as well. So then that will give you, uh, you basically get all the features as, um, you know, I still call it CDS. Sorry, I still call it CDS. <laughs> but you get all the features that you get, would get with the plan too. The only thing you can't do is share. So that's what I'd recommend to people too, saying, hey, you not want to fully, like even just developers learning, sign up for all that stuff and then that could be your sandbox environment to play around and learn in. Very cool. All right. Yeah. Uh, what has been helpful in your career that you might share with those just getting started or those looking to level up their own careers? Oh, whoa, good question. Uh, can you repeat that question? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what has been helpful in your career that you would share with others who might uh, just be getting started or looking to level up their own careers? Networking. Networking has been key. And, you know, getting involved, uh, speaking was actually speaking was one of the things for me. Um, I'll never forget when I did my first three SharePoint Saturday and I was nervous <laughs> and shaky and all this stuff. And you know, I, I, looking back, I still laugh at that. But that's what helped me come out of my shell and, and, and do things. But for those getting, it depends on what your passion is and what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You have some people mm -hmm. that actually want to start speaking and getting involved in events. You have others that just want to start learning how to develop and do these different things on this side, you know, learning how to do Teams Dev, learning how to work with the Power Platform and stuff. Um, start you know there's a lot of there's uh, weekly community calls there's the power platform power apps community call there's the you know start joining in on those calls um and and I, that's what i'd recommend and i think seeing that too there's a lot of times i can't join because i have conflicting things but getting joining in that and seeing it is you see the passion other people have you start mm -hmm. connecting with people and you continue to grow very cool so where can our listeners go to sort of follow you and uh, keep up with uh, whatever you're working on? Um, you can find me on Twitter, cwheeler76. Yeah, I'm giving away my age there too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can also find me on LinkedIn. And but uh, and what else? Um, Canvas.com. Uh, that's, okay. you know, yeah, Twitter. You can find me on Twitter. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Christina. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Yeah, thank you. This was good. All right, chat, hang out just one minute. We'll wrap up the podcast. Um, we'll want to be respectful of Christina's time. So as we uh, upload the audio, if you have any additional questions, feel free to ask them there. Um, otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll catch you in just one minute. That was Christina Wheeler. Christina is, a, Christina is currently a principal solution architect at Canvas Consulting. With over 15 years of experience in the industry, Christina has has knowledge in SharePoint development, administration, branding, and business intelligence. If you like this episode, please like, rate, and review on iTunes. Find show notes, blog posts, and more at sixfiguredev.com. Catch us live each week on Twitch, and be sure to follow us on Twitter at sixfiguredev. This has been another episode of the Six Figure Developer Podcast, helping others reach their potential. I am John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I am John Ash. 
All right. Ooh, nailed it. 44 even. Nice. <laughs> How was it? How did I do? You did no, it's good. So we good. are we are still live on Twitch, and uh, mm -hmm. they can still see and hear us. That is stage two. What were you doing? Uh, not not working. Yeah. Yeah, not, not working, working is stage two. That's <clears throat> so. We've we've got a heckler in the crowd. Uh, our longtime listener uh, Wesley is is commenting that uh, Clayton's audio is a little loud. Okay. No, no, no. He was he was commenting that you were a little quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. So, so you got was it? Did I count three dogs? I'm, with... Funny story behind that. <laughs> I had two. Yeah. I had two, and then right before Christmas, you fed I did it a after text midnight. Message. Oh yeah, <laughs> turned into a gremlin. Uh, I I I got wet. I uh, got a text message from a friend who was literally moving to Florida that night and sent me a picture of uh, this beautiful dog, Seamus, who was in a kennel crate. And she just said, help, I need help. Do you know anybody that wants a dog? And I'm thinking, uh-oh, did the dog attack? What happened? Come to find out, no, I learned what happened. Um, her parents had adopted this dog about over a year ago. So he was a, he was a baby then. And um, but the parents are older, so they're in their mm. 80s and they physically can't handle him. So oh. what had happened was and my friends can't have dogs. Uh, they were moving. Mm. They just couldn't. So I, I they I guess Seamus got all excited walking with the grandparents and the grandchild, saw the neighbor, started bolting down, pulled grandpa <laughs> down. Grandpa fell on grandma. And before you know it, right, that's what happened. And so um, he uh, I took him in temporarily and then the daughter was supposed to take the dog. And then that fell through, too, because the daughter moved. So basically, everyone was moving and could not have dogs. Uh, so I was supposed to rehome him. Yeah, this is his new home. Uh, so I currently have three dogs, but he's 17, probably like 18 months now. My, my other humongous rescue over here, Kona, is a little over two. And these, these they've become best buddies. But I also have a Labrador who just turned 10, and so he's kind of at the end of his years, and mm -hmm. it's sad, but he's going down here further and further. So um, I have three. Yep. I have yeah, we, three. We, we had two when we moved to Florida and stayed in a 500-square-foot bedroom apartment with my, me, my wife, our young son, and two big dogs. That, wow. was, that was fun. Um, we, we now have just one young dog probably two two and a half years old that my son picked out and she is 60 pounds of muscle and just nah we we haven't taken the time to train her so that's that's on us uh she um my, my son was doing sidewalk chalk on on the pavement mm -hmm. and with yellow with red chalk and the dog rolled around to that and, and so we got pictures of her just <laughs> white dog covered in red so Clayton has referred to her as the murder dog. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's the murder dog. She, she looks like a pit bull, but she's not. We we actually had the doggy DNA test done, and she's we we thought she was pit bull and Dalmatian, and she's neither. Turn, turns oh, out she? she's ninety percent Schnauzer, and <laughs> uh, she's Pointer and Kona. Something else. Yeah, I don't. So Kona, hundred pound beast. Didn't know mm. he was going to be that big. Um, I don't know if you can see him, but I had, mm. I had lost, uh, I had a, uh, uh, I had a boxer lab pit mix who was just a sweet angel and I rescued mm. him and poor thing had been through a lot. So I had to, you know, do a lot of rehabilitation with him and, you know, he ended up being my mom. My mom wanted me to get rid of him and he ended up being my mom's favorite dog. Well, I lost him at age five to cancer and then mm. it was like unexpectedly, like the day I found out is the day I lost him. So it was a big shock. So I, uh, a friend of mine fosters, and, and she had um, Kona, who someone dumped him the day after Christmas. So he was a post-Christmas puppy dump. And he's a rescue. Um, and uh, my friend goes, oh, he's going to be small, probably like 30 pounds. I said, oh, no, no. He's, <laughs> I mean, he was tiny when I first had him. I said, no, I figured he'd be maybe 60, 70 pounds max. Mm -hmm. And um, I figured at the time he's changed his look has changed, but I thought, okay, he's he's some kind of maybe lab pit mix, something like that. Boy, was I way off. He's half German Shepherd. And wow. when German Shepherd came back, I'm like, what? So he's American Staffordshire Terrier. Is that considered pit? I know Pitbull's a breed, but he's an am he's half Amstaff, half German Shepherd. 
So I was shocked when the German Shepherd came back, but then I've got photos somewhere. All of a sudden, one day, his ears went straight up like the shepherd. I'm like, <laughs> <gasps> there it is. Yeah. But, yeah, and it's lit. Yeah. That, that's what ours is, is, is Staffordshire Terrier. So, yeah. Yep. For the longest time, we thought surely Pitbull because just yep. looks looks aggressive, sweet as she can be. I'm kind of dumb as a rock. But... <laughs> <laughs> Colin is smart. I put him through training, but he kept growing and growing before you know it. Now he's 100 pounds. And, but, he's, uh, but I see the he's a very German Shepherd now. Like now that he's gotten older, just behavior, demeanor. Um, he's got some possession aggression issues, which I discovered with toys, which I had mm. to, f to handle that. And, uh, but I discovered that that's very common for German Shepherds. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to, he's very German shepherd. And, but like I said, I didn't see it before, but now I do, but now I know how to handle him. I think Seamus, I haven't got him tested yet. He reminds me a lot of the Harley who I lost. Mm -hmm. um, he's smaller. He's like the size that Harley was. I, and I think he's a, I think he's a boxer mm -hmm. Amstaff mix. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if I'm actually closer on that one than this one. You know, you know what uh, fixes the aggression issues? He's taken an eight year old boy that just runs full speed at the dog and tackles the dog. <laughs> dog gets over it. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it was when I told he buries bones, which I had to basically take every bone that he buries and get rid of it or hide it or allow them to have the bones in kennels to keep mm -hmm. them separated. Once they were all gone, I don't buy anything that resembles a bone shape. Like mm -hmm. I can buy him as other things. Fine. They'll chew it. Have fun. Give him anything that resembles a bone. He's buried bones since he was a puppy. He's have, even have, have, do, have you been able to break them of that? Because we have a dog that is very similar. Yeah, yeah, you how don't buy you, bones. Don't, it how doesn't did you matter. So she, like, pizza crusts or, like, I don't know, uh, some, like, scrap food that we, like, give her that she doesn't want to eat right then. She will walk around the house, like, whining to go out so she could bury it. And if you don't do that, then she finds a place to, ha to bury it in the house. We have several <laughs> times pulled back our, our, our sheets on our bed and found, like, a half a sandwich buried underneath, oh. our, <laughs> buried underneath our pillow. Like, because she's like, no, no, oh, that, oh, that was, that's a great that was me. That, that was, that was my, that's my sandwich. I want it back. <laughs> How disappointing, yeah. like, if you yeah, buried a, a, a pizza crust in the backyard, you go back for it later, and it's like, oh, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's actually really funny. He only does it with bones. That's the thing. Only with bones. Oh, but toys. Here's what happens though. I have BarkBox and I have to, but here's what I do with BarkBox. Now, I have to do the super chewy ones. Now, I canceled it for a while because he would just destroy everything. His goal every time, I used to have a bin full of dog toys. Once Kona discovered how powerful his bite was. Now, he chewed up a wall, got a couple things. He's over that. And I still got baseboards I have to fix. So that was more of people staying at my house watching my dogs when I travel and didn't follow the rules. Um, but uh, he, he, his goal, like every day, go in the box. I'm going to destroy a new toy today. And that was his <laughs> daily goal. <laughs> Before you know it, I look in, I'm like, oh, only thing that's left are the toys that he can't destroy. So, um, and so I started, I was doing the super chewy bark box things and my lab needs the other stuff, but then all of a sudden he started destroying that stuff quickly. So I canceled. Well, I decided to give it another try since I have my, you know, other dog and it's working out, but, uh, but, but Seamus, these two. So I had new toys. Here's what I discovered. When I get a box, I do not, before I'd get all excited, Hey, bark box, bark box. Now I just play it down, pretend like I got nothing and I put it away for a while. Then I slowly introduce the toys out because if I do that, it's better. But if all of a sudden I have them do the toys out, he gets possessive over it. They'll play. But I had a little attack one day, never happened again. Ended up at the vet. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And that's when I'm, I was in shock. I'm like, oh, I did not know my dog had this <laughs> in him. Wow. So, uh, but it was one of those things. He was guarding a toy. I didn't realize Seamus, they were fine for two weeks. But Seamus went to grab that toy and a fight broke out. Mm. So after that, I was devastated. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And I was in shock and I was pissed at him. And, but, but I get it. I mean, I, I, then I, now I know though, I understand. I've learned, I've uh, talked to my, my vet thinks it was a one-off and sure enough, poor thing was in a cone. I mean, I learned he fight. I mean, he'll, he'll stand his own a hundred pounds, 60 pounds, 60 pounder. He stood his own, but, um, and they've been, I mean, they were best friends before that. And they're even better friends now. But I brought Seamus home in a cone, and I, I, not like I can read his mind, but the, the look on his face and how bad it looked like he felt, been fine ever since. And now he lets him do whatever he wants to him.
So do you do you think the cone would work on a three and a five year old? Because <laughs> they also break into fights pretty much. I have daily one I can send you. I have like the softer one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, ha I have to ask about the violin on the on the back wall there. Uh, it's very nice. So I used to be a musician, and since I'm home now, I'm starting to get back into things. Um, and I've, you know, I really want a drum set. Um, I want to pick up the guitar, but I'm like, here's what happened. I started watching, I saw some video long, years ago, and it was these um, these girls <laughs> playing uh, System of a Down. So one of the System of a Down songs mm. or something, I'm like, with a guitar effects pedal. The stuff oh, that yeah. I see yep. now that people can do with the violins, and I like Lindsey Sterling, but I'd watch, I'm like, oh. So I do, I have my effects pedal that I just got. Nice. And now keep in mind, I'm having to reteach myself. So I have my little cheat thing right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yep, yep. Cause I have to, I gotta relearn everything, but um, got my effects pedal and nice. uh, I'm gonna start playing again. What, what's what the do. brand of violin? I, Cause that really looks really nice. It's, it reminds me of the Yamaha like silent series, but um, that uh, it is not exactly the same. Do you know? Oh, it's not it expensive. It's my good starter one. It starts okay. with a C. I gotta remember. I'm I'm starting off uh, before I'm allowing myself to invest in anything more. It's like okay, it. let me get this. Um, and this is like intermediate or something. I can't remember the name, but it starts with a C. But it's like they're a good reputable company. Okay. But what it is is I'm like okay, let me get started with this, and then see where I go from there. Yeah, I've been looking for a good one because I also play. Um and. But I have I I have like my real instrument, and it's really I have a pickup for it uh, which I use um, if I'm like playing someplace. But it's a pain to like with four kids uh, to like find a place oh, yeah. where I can uh, quietly practice or do anything with. So, so the I've cool been... thing is is I can actually and I mean I know all of the electronic violins pretty much have this. But um, oh here's the name. I mean it's it's a cheap brand, but whatever it is, I'm starting out. But I have, um, I plug in, I can plug in my headphones right to there. Oh, nice. Or I can plug into the amp, but I plug yeah. in the headphones and I can play. No one can hear yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. But I'm, I'm still, oh, that's the name of the brand. But like I said, it's not an expensive brand. It's just something I'm starting with. Okay, okay, yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to take it. It, it looks really nice. I, I like the look of well, it. Well, this is, I, someone else had had it. I'm like, and, and I'm like, oh, that looks really nice. And I saw, like, a lot of them are playing where it's like the half, but I wanted mm -hmm. the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and it sounds really nice. I'm just still, like I said, I'm relearning everything. Um, well, and the, as you know, you see a lot of the, a lot of the, like a lot of my friends, even Tabagitsi, they have all their guitars in the background. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm putting my violin in the background. <laughs> and I then like I it. have my amp, my amp down there. So my daughter's like old Fender amp yeah. that I dug out of her old room because my daughter's all grown up. She's 25, almost 26, so she lives up in Athens. So, but yeah, my little, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> learn. <laughs> so, so so what's ne what's next for you it's a, you said you were onboarding to a new project i um, would imagine that's going to keep you fairly busy for a while it is going to keep me busy for a while so um yeah so the new project um it is um where is it so it is and as and you know i mean since my daughters are grown up it's all good i don't i don't have a nine to five schedule these days anymore but i don't know that i really ever did um but, uh, oh, what is this? Okay, good. She sees that. Okay, sorry. Being t pinged already. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I'm starting, um, like I said, I'm still wrapping my head, but I'm um, I'm, I'm looking forward to working on the, the engagement, like I said, once I wrap around. But it's, what did I say that I'm doing? I'm, I'm basically program manager. I'm basically doing a program manager role right now for mm -hmm. um, these partner deployments um, for Power Automate and uh, customer insights. Cool. And so it's very partner engaged. So it's I'll be working with the partners and the Power Cat and the engineering teams um, and to make sure it's successful deployments um, and so on. So I'm excited. It's it's gonna it's a new role for me. Mm -hmm. But I, I, it'll be good, um, and I'm already and also already leveraging my skill sets because what I'm doing too is helping improve this internal process that's being done to manage these partners. Um, so I can tell you, I already created a SharePoint site and a flow to uh, pull these forms. But I'm already building automation. Nice. <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay. So I took over someone else's role, um, and you know, I, I don't know if you guys, you guys know, V dashes have certain life term. 
and then you have to take a certain break and so on. So uh, mm -hmm. took over someone's role. And as I took over that role, everybody has their own process and how they do things. And of course, they brought me in saying, Christina, we love your technical skills. This is great because you can help us improve these processes. And as you know, I can build some of this stuff in the Power Platform in SharePoint with my eyes closed. And sure enough, I did. <laughs> yeah, I think we've, we've all been V-dashes at one point or another and yep. had to roll off because of the weird yep date requirements and such so <laughs> i think that had to come with i don't know maybe some lawsuit a long time ago who knows no, i'm sure yeah. yeah but i think i spent like two months on a project because of that <laughs> reason, which was like ridiculous because i barely got rolled on just to be rolling off but yeah so yeah it's gonna keep me pretty busy um but before that you know i was yeah it's gonna keep me busy but in a good way it's good busy okay. good, good. Cool. So, yeah well, we could keep going like this all night long. This has been a lot of fun, but uh, we'll let you <laughs> wrangle the dogs and, yeah. and maybe give them some exercise. Uh, we are looking at about three weeks out from releasing the podcast episode. So unless you've got something specific you'd like to coordinate with, I think we're looking at May 3rd. People are walking. That's all. Okay. <laughs> People are just walking. They're allowed to do that. I don't think they are. Yeah, that's we got the same thing. Going May third, that sounds good. All right, excellent. So, uh, in the meantime, if there's anything we can do for you or anything you need from us, just be sure to let us know. Uh, chat. We will be back uh, tomorrow night. We are hosting the St. Pete.net meetup at 7 p.m. Eastern. So feel free to join us there and then. And then Wednesday, this coming Wednesday at 8 p.m., join us for live coding, live streaming of some personal projects. Uh, we will be back next Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern for the live broadcast of the podcast. Um, till then, be sure to like, subscribe, do all the, the Twitch things. And with that, we will raid our friend over at Mastermind. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Bye.